Hello and welcome to Journal, I'm Steve Kendall. The major political parties have held their conventions and now they're getting in earnest about campaign 2020. Here to talk about how they got there, where they are now, and where we're gonna go between now and November is a Professor Melissa K. Miller from the Department of Political Science at Bowling Green State University. Uh, Dr. Miller, welcome to the Journal today. Great to be here, Steve. Now, we know who the candidates are now, finally, after a long, long trek through the summer. Talk a little bit about how each of the candidates got there. Obviously, the Democrats had a lot of people at the beginning, and there really wasn't much doubt that Donald Trump was going to be the Republican nominee. But talk a little bit of how we got to where we are right now. So I will actually start with the Republican side. Mm -hmm. So there were several challengers to mm -hmm. Donald Trump, but they really struggled to get on the ballot in mm -hmm. any states. Um, there was such pushback. The party has really become the party of the president. And that's not uncommon for the right. incumbent president. The identity of the party really becomes Barack Obama or becomes George W. Bush. And that's happened under President Trump. Um, of the three Republican former office holders who challenged the president, only one of them, former Massachusetts Governor William Weld, won a single delegate. Oh. So. That is, in essence, <laughs> he was unchallenged in the end. So, of course, his nomination was a given. Okay. The interesting story is really on the Democratic side, where there was a really diverse um, roster of candidates. There were women. We had um, an African-American man, Asian-American man, um, a gay man, an openly gay man. Um, we had Kamala Harris, who's both black and Asian American. Um, so I could go on. We had a really, um, we saw a really diverse list of candidates mm -hmm. on the Democratic side. Right. And what happened was mm -hmm. um, that in those first two all important Iowa and New Hampshire contests, Joe Biden did very poorly, placing ah. fourth in Iowa and fifth in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. All right. So it looked like. This was going to be initially between Pete Buttigieg, the former mayor of South Bend, and Bernie Sanders. Um, it, and mm -hmm. what happened is Biden kept saying, wait till South Carolina. Okay. And at right. the time, I remember thinking, boy, you're not doing well if you have to say, wait till the third yeah. contest. But I think <laughs> what the Biden team realized was that the electorate is very different once you move on from a very lily white caucus in Iowa and a lily white primary in New Hampshire. Ah, okay. That then when the contest goes to South Carolina, you get a much more diverse mm -hmm. electorate with a sizable African American population and, ah. and portion of that Democratic primary electorate. And that was going to change everything. Mm -hmm. And indeed it did. Right. Joe Biden definitely benefited from Congressman Jim Clyburn endorsing him. Mm -hmm. And it was just like the floodgates opened and suddenly all these votes went to Joe Biden and he was really unstoppable after that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he just kept winning. Uh, Sanders picked up a couple more, but it was really pretty clear fairly early on that he, he had so much momentum, Joe Mentum, as they mm -hmm. called yeah. it at the time. <laughs> um, so he really... Yeah. Things turned around for him in South Carolina in large part because African-American voters then were able to cast uh, their ballots in big numbers for the first time, and that changed everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in, in some cases, when you go through that primary, especially when you don't do well in Iowa, that sorts that basically takes a few people out right away, and then New Hampshire tends to take people out of the field, and in his case, coming in as sort of being, you know, this, this guy who had been vice president, had been a senator, was the, you know, a long time establishment person of the Democratic Party. You almost wondered when he kept saying, South, as you said, South Carolina, well, what's going to happen there because you've not done well? And it was almost like it was extremely disappointing. It was like underperforming for him. And yet South Carolina, as you said, turned that all around. That's right. And I think people had really kind of written off his candidacy mm -hmm. at that point. Um, looking back, the, you know, he, he had been attacked on the debate stage, like throughout right. the debates. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the common refrains was like, our party needs to move forward. And right. he was perceived as sort of a candidate of the past. And Biden really liked taking on that mantle of, of mm -hmm. being, being Obama's partner in the, in the Obama Biden administration. But it was deemed to be sort of, and you know, an outdated message. It's time for a mm. new crop. 
Um, and most of his competitors, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders side, were much younger. Um, but right. in the end, it, it wasn't enough. None of those others, um, save for Sanders, I would argue, really caught enough fire broadly to get mm -hmm. the nomination. So it came down to um, Sanders and Biden, and Biden had far more support. Sanders had definitely had support within the black community, but it was outstripped by Biden's, ah, and that made a big difference. Right. Yeah, and and I guess too, if you look at as you said that wide range of candidates, were they perceived as maybe being just being narrow in their focus, and they weren't it didn't have a broad appeal like maybe Biden did or or Sanders to some degree? Was that part of it, or was just just because they were new and Biden had this name that? That, the, that a lot of people knew. They knew Joe Biden. He didn't have to do well in New Hampshire and Iowa, obviously. Yeah. You know, I think that really, what was really key in terms of how the Democratic primary electorate was viewing mm -hmm. the candidates and trying to sort through the candidates was that there were several who were really in the moderate lane. Ah, and Joe okay. Biden was, was the one, he was the key candidate in that moderate lane. I would add Kamala Harris in there too. Amy Klobuchar, U.S. Senator from Minnesota. And then the, there was another pack of candidates that were vying for the progressive lane. Ah, okay. All right, there you had most notably Bernie Sanders and U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. Okay. And so that's where, um, and, and you know what, party primaries, that's what they're about in a way. It's hmm. about the electorate getting to look at the candidates and decide which way is the party going to go. Right. Is it going to go in this direction with this candidate's platform or this other direction? And for a while now, what we've seen is that the major fissure within the Democratic Party is between moderates like Biden, Harris, Klobuchar, mm -hmm. and progressives like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and all. although they didn't run for mm -hmm. president, I would put Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan wow. Omar, there are others that are in that camp. Mm -hmm. and, and in 2020, voters decided and picked um, that moderate lane. Huh. It gets interesting, and we can talk about it later, because the Republicans and the president, no big surprise, mm -hmm. are trying to portray the Biden ticket as being very radical, way to the mm -hmm. far left. But in fact, they were the moderate choice. And, you know, Biden and then Harris, because she was chosen, ended up up on top okay well, when we come back let's let's talk about the little because that obviously it looks like is the way they're trying well especially Kamala Harris they're going that the idea is to make her look far 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 to the left and you, what you're saying is maybe that's not the case exactly so we'll be back in just a moment with dr. Melissa Miller from Bowling Green State University here on the journal thank you for staying with us here on the journal our guest is dr. Melissa Miller from Bowling Green State University's Department of Political Science and we touched at the end of that last segment about the fact that the Democrats have chosen two very moderate candidates out of that group that they had. Uh, Kamala Harris, not necessarily the favorite of some of the people in the Democratic Party because to her, to them, she's too far to the center. And yet she's caught an interesting because on the other hand, the idea will now be from the Republican side to paint her as being extremely radical left, even though that's not how she's portrayed in her own party. So talk a little bit of how that's gonna play out as we, in the, over the next few weeks, the next couple of months. So one thing to note is that having a moderate at the top of the ticket mm -hmm. to, to moderates, uh, you know, for president and vice president, isn't a bad way to approach a general election mm -hmm. where you're now no longer trying to win the nomination among the Democratic base. Right. You're trying to appeal to all voters. You're trying to peel away as many independent voters mm -hmm. who are in the middle and right. possibly some disaffected Trump supporters. So in some respects, um, it's possible, and uh, though I, I would say debatable because I talk to people about this all the time and they say Bernie would be the better candidate, he excites more enthusiasm and mm. so forth. Okay. But, but typically what political science shows is that if the candidate that gets nominated isn't moderate, and this goes for the Democratic or Republican side, once they start campaigning for the general election, they tack to the center, sure. right? Mm -hmm. So if yeah. they, frankly, if they really are too far to the left, they try no. to move to the center. Well, in this case, as you said, Steve, mm -hmm. um, the progressive wing of the party, I think it was disappointed both in the choice of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, but mm -hmm. has firmly gotten behind mm -hmm. the ticket, um, sort of unified with the goal of the party defeating Donald Trump mm -hmm. um, in November. 
You also mentioned that the Trump team and Republicans more generally are going to try and have begun to try to portray both Kamala Harris and Joe Biden mm -hmm. as really radical left, far left. Mm -hmm. We'll see whether that works. Mm -hmm. um, right. Those, you know, viewers out there watching your show, I'm sure, are, are a little more, uh, uh, you know, up to date on public affairs and more knowledgeable, perhaps, of the candidates. Um, but Joe Biden, like I said, was a disappointment to the far left yeah. in the Democratic Party because <laughs> right. he wasn't deemed radical enough. Right. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Now, mm -hmm. one of the arguments being made by the Trump campaign is that Biden is a puppet of the far left. All oh, right. Okay. So they've tried. They're kind of trying different strategies. One is, oh, Biden's a radical leftist. Another argument is, well, he's a puppet of the radical left, so he's just being used by the radical left. I got to tell you, Steve, so mm -hmm. far, and 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 mm -hmm. it really came to a fever pitch, of course, at the Republican National Convention. But a lot of that criticism of Biden over the summer wasn't really sticking. It wasn't mm -hmm. really resonating okay. in a way that really moved the poll numbers. Um, so we'll see if. The Republicans really are focused their message and get some traction out of that. Right now, from the from the Republican side of things, is that the, is that going to be the right now? Is that the only focus they have? What are, what are the messages that the president has to portray to make his campaign work the way he wants it to work? What is what do they have to do with Donald Trump? Normally, an incumbent president usually has a lot of advantage, and there's it's with with COVID nineteen with all the other things that have happened. Does he really, does he have the advantage that a typical incumbent going for a second term would have here? It's certainly much more difficult than than um, incumbents in, in mm -hmm. modern political history because of the, the global pandemic. We've never had a presidential race mm -hmm. run under these circumstances and the huge downturn in the economy. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So very it's it's very difficult circumstances for which there is no playbook there's no template for hmm. you know and and i mean that's what consultants do and that's what campaigns ah. <laughs> do they look to prior um similar campaigns to try to figure out what strategies worked then and there is no playbook like that ah. um so i think I'll, I'll say it first about president trump and then i'll then i'll then i'll mm -hmm. apply it to biden but a key challenge for the Trump campaign is how much do they just try to tear down Joe Biden in order to win? Right. So how much mm -hmm. do they focus on this message of he's too radical or he's a puppet of the radical left, throw in um, crime and law and order, he's weak on crime, we'll have violence in the streets. We saw a lot of that, um, that this is the scary America that we'll see if Joe Biden is elected yeah. versus how much do they play up the president, his record, um, you know, you know, going on mm -hmm. on his record of things like appointing conservative justices, right. um, mm -hmm. cracking down on free trade and getting tough with America's trade partners and and the like. So it was really interesting in Trump's acceptance speech on Thursday night at the convention that there was like a State of the Union portion to it where he really lit, listed off right. all those accomplishments. Mm -hmm. That came at the beginning. The whole second half was very heavy anti-Democrats, anti-Biden. Mm -hmm. How to get that mix right? It's the challenge of every presidential campaign. Ah. So he's got that challenge. Mm -hmm. I would predict that we're going to see a lot of tearing down Joe Biden. They haven't they haven't really settled on what is that negative message going to be. They've been experimenting with various things. I got to tell you that what the research shows is that a negative message about an opponent tends to work if it if it reinforces an existing narrative about ah. the candidate. And I think that's the problem with this Biden is a puppet of the radical left. Mm -hmm. That is not an existing narrative about Joe Biden. We went through many months of complaints that he wasn't progressive enough. So, so you can see there's a challenge mm -hmm. there. And I'll just quickly say Joe Biden has the same challenge. To right. what extent does he offer a program for the future, a program for battling the coronavirus, rebuilding the economy and so forth versus focus on um, people's reservations and worries and concerns and fears about Trump and um, kind of yeah. tearing down the president? They both have to try to thread that needle. And I tell you, we're not gonna know who did it best until after until, this election is decided. Yeah, yeah. And, and, we, and we're gonna go to a break here in just a moment, but you, and I guess we'll never know for sure, if COVID-19 doesn't happen, is this even a race? 
does Trump win without even having to go to the even go and vote himself because he was on a roll. I mean, basically he was on a roll until this. And if you look at that, and maybe we can touch more in detail later, the, the however you want to portray the way he's handled COVID-19, and some people say it's been wonderful, the other side says, no, it's been terrible. But without that in the equation, he's an incumbent running on what would perceived as a good economy. That's right. And so I'll just quickly say mm -hmm. before the break that one of the number one factors that political scientists use to predict the outcome of presidential elections mm -hmm. is where things stand in the economy. Ah. And so without COVID, without sur a surge in unemployment and the like, mm -hmm. Trump was actually in pretty good position with the caveat that his popularity remains Still. very low. Mm -hmm. So okay. it was going to be a little bit tricky, but so much easier. COVID totally complicates his reelection. Yeah. Another, sure. another, another variable in this strange year of 2020. OK, we'll be back in just a moment with more from uh, Dr. Melissa Miller from the Department of Political Science here at Bowling Green State University on The Journal. Back in a moment. Thank you for staying with us here on Journal. Our guest is Dr. Melissa Miller from Bowling Green State University. And we've talked about how everybody got to this point. We're roughly two months out from Election Day. Where are people going to go now? Where are the two campaigns going to go? Uh, we talked a little bit about their messages. Their strategies in this, this odd thing where you can't hold big campaign events, uh, even going door to door, is, you know, which is the staple of especially local elections, that's sort of all these things are the traditional way of campaigning are kind of in flux, too. So how do they go about managing campaigning for a presidential election in this now almost virtual environment we have to live in? Well, as I said before, there's no template mm -hmm. for how to do this right. and win yeah. an election. So really, all bets are off mm -hmm. um, as to how they do it. I think the president will probably continue to hold more mm -hmm. of these face-to-face -face events, as we saw at the White House on the on the right. final night of the Republican National Convention, um, which, of course, creates a lot of criticism and blowback mm -hmm. from the Democratic side and negative headlines about um, folks being unmasked and not socially distanced. But it appears that the president is willing to take take those risks mm -hmm. to have um, those live crowds. And, and it, it does make a difference, of course. Huh. I mean, it makes for a more exciting event. Sure. Um, and and uh, I don't expect to see anything along those lines from the Democrats. It would be entirely inconsistent with their message so far. The masking that Joe Biden has prominently, he and, and Dr. Joe Biden have worn at every public appearance. I mean, don't, I wouldn't expect to see that. Now, what I would expect to see okay. is um, both sides, and if I were advising either of them, I would say, you know, maybe hold smaller events, but try to create um, sort of made for TV or made for social media moments that can go uh, viral, that you can push out on social media. Because honestly, social media played an outside role in 2016 in that election. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to play an even bigger role in 2020 when candidates can't bring their supporters together. So I'd expect uh, a lot of that. And third, I would look for those debates. We've got uh, three uh, presidential debates coming up, plus a vice presidential debate. That's the standard four debates during the fall Great. season. Um, and those, like the conventions, I think will refocus public attention on the two candidates, the differences between them. Um, and if 2016 is any indication, I think you'll see high viewership for those. Sure. Um, you know, again, it's because there's not a lot on. To, you know, <laughs> people don't have their typical sports to watch. Right. So we may see that presidential debates get a little bit more viewership. They will perhaps um, have some outsized importance this year. Now, when we when we talk about dealing with the way the way we've dealt with uh, the pandemic uh, is and I know there's got to be a ton of research and it's ongoing. Is it a good thing for the president to have coronavirus even be in the news at all? I know he's making a point by saying the way the way he's conducting his events, which are basically in some cases fewer masks than the other side would like to see. So is that is that a play to, is there are two bases here, obviously. One is coronavirus isn't a thing. The other one is, yeah, it's a big thing. So is he playing to his base by kind of using that as a as a as a wedge sort of topic for this or not? Well, I think um, here's the problem. Here's the challenge that the coronavirus mm -hmm. um, poses to the president. One is just the tens of thousands of lives, you know, over mm. 180,000 lost now at the time of us taping this. Right. 
mm -hmm. um, segment. Um, and, and the problem is that the president is emphasizing some of the steps he took at the beginning to try to keep the virus off of our shores um, mm -hmm. for as long as he could, efforts to try to get um, ventilators and so forth. So he's really pushing the positive, here are these positive things I did. At the same time, Americans' lives have been really disrupted and continue to mm. be disrupted. Okay. So that's what makes it difficult. It's, it's harder to spin because mm. it's something that is affecting every, it's affecting uh, us here today. Normally, sure. Steve, I join you in the studio, which right. I love to do, but yeah. we are um, mm -hmm. socially distant, <laughs> yeah. actually miles away from each other <laughs> right. conducting the interview. So I think the coronavirus is definitely problematic. And on the Democratic side, I would say um, that while the, the violence that has been in the streets of Portland and more recently in Kenosha, mm -hmm. um, it's nothing, you know, I'm not at all saying that the Democrats created that. That's a whole other segment we can do. But right. anytime there's violence, someone being shot in the street, you know, at a protest or an officer being shot or whether it's a Trump supporter or you know a Black Lives Matter protester um, who's who's the victim in, in in this violence. That's not good for the Biden campaign because it feeds into the narrative that there's lawlessness. Um, right. The president saying, "You need me. I'm strong on law and order." Although it should be pointed out, and the Democrats are trying to do that, right. that this is happening. Trump's America, not Biden's America. Right. So boy, it's complicated. Yeah. But I would say that the coronavirus the protests and, and some of the violence we've seen around these protests are problematic in different ways for each of the candidates. Right, yeah. and, and, and you make a good point at the end because I know I, I saw this morning uh, a Biden ad that said, you know, you're, you're unsafe in Donald Trump's America. And at the same time, you have Donald Trump saying, you're going to be even less safe in Joe Biden's America. So it's funny how we're going to fight over who's, who's going to be worse for the country. I mean, it's kind of an interesting, which, as you said, right. negative advertising this, but this is an interesting one because you'll be worse. Yeah, it's bad now, but you'll be a lot worse off when it comes to violence. That's the Trump thing. And then Biden is, look what you have. OK, so it's, right. yeah. But, well, and I was yeah. going to say, this is not yeah. like mm -hmm. 1984's morning in America, right? No, no. When Reagan ran that very... Like yeah, positive, ad stirring, yeah. goose bump inducing ad morning in America. Yeah. This is the opposite of that. Yeah. And, and I guess if we look at presidential elections, each of them, for the most part, develop their own unique look, especially after the fact. We probably look at 16 and say, well, that was we, that was different than than 12 was 12. Yeah. So I guess 20 is going to be one of those where I look back and go, this is one different than we've ever seen before. But we we're starting to say that now every four years about elections that, oh, here's a presidential election, unlike any other one we've ever had. And I guess that's just that's the new normal for that. It is, although I got to tell you, 2020, like, I <laughs> it is the most different because of the pandemic, right? right? So mm -hmm. forget the themes and everything. But when you can't even go door to door, as you point out, which is yeah. vitally important, especially for local candidates, sure, right? Yeah. Um, but also for presidential candidates, they can't send their supporters door to door in states like Ohio and Michigan, mm -hmm. where this battle will be, you know, really waged and won. Um, right. So it really is truly different. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna weigh yeah. it on the side of yes, this is. <laughs> Yeah. very different than yeah. anything we've seen and, and we, we've got just a couple of minutes let's talk a little about ohio's role in this election because i know that ohio has been a bellwether for who gets elected for a lot of years um are we still in that mode is that who we are yet in ohio you know i like to remind viewers that ohio still holds the best record of picking presidents the huh. fact that ohio uh, voted for Trump and the, the Electoral College votes of Ohio went to Trump is just very consistent with this record that goes all the way back to 1896, um, which is Ohio has the best record of picking the winner. And you have to go back to 1960 to find an election where Ohio picked the loser. So in 1960, Ohio picked Kennedy, uh, mm -hmm. Richard, I'm sorry, Nixon. Richard Nixon, mm -hmm. right. Uh, voted for Nixon and gave the Electoral College votes to Nixon and Kennedy won. Yeah. So Ohio, but but where people are saying, oh, but Ohio is not really a bellwether anymore, it's because the vote percentage was eight points in favor of the president, which was much bigger, oh, okay. way bigger mm. 
than Trump's, you know, popular vote, which he didn't even win. So right. that's where Ohio in 2016 perhaps seemed to be getting out of step. Um, hmm. okay. I would argue, though, that it's entirely possible Ohio, and I check the polls not daily, I, and I don't check every single poll that comes out, but I look at that average poll of polls to see about twice a week, and Ohio is such a toss-up. It is ah. possible that everything will come down to Ohio. It ah. truly is possible okay. that that's what could happen. So I encourage um, folks to keep your eyes certainly on Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin, sort of the big three, the mm -hmm. golden three, right, that delivered the upper Midwest and the presidency to Donald Trump. But in some ways, Ohio has been more of a toss up than say Pennsylvania has in recent polls, which are just a snapshot. But right. I think again, yeah. this campaign will be decided in the Midwest and okay. and Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin will be right there in the mix. Okay. Great, well, we're, we're right up to our time limit here. One thing that we'll, we'll have you back on, I'm sure between now and election day, at least once or twice, one of the things we'll talk about then will be, when will we know who has won the presidency? Because that's a question out there, and we don't really have time to dig into it right now, but that's the other part of this. It probably won't be on election night, so. No, it, I would yeah. say fasten your seatbelts. It could be a week or two or three before we know the outcome. Wow. Okay, all right. Well, Dr. Melissa Miller from Bowling Green State University, thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. And we'll, I'm sure we'll be in touch between now and November. So thank you again for being on with us. Yep. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. You can check us out at WBGU.org. And of course, watch us every week on WBGU PBS. We'll see you again next time on The Journal.